gentlemen, and welcome to this debate and open discussion on the, the existence of God held by the UCLU and Krishna Consciousness Society. Just to introduce myself, my name is Natasha Davis. I'm the president of the Debating Society here at UCL, and I've been kindly invited to come here and share this debate as a neutral party, so thank you very much indeed. I'd like to introduce far more important people, though. On my right-hand side here is Dr. Stephen Law. He is the editor of the Royal Institute of Philosophy's journal called Think. He's also a Doctor of Philosophy from Oxford University and is also a research fellow at this university too. And he's affiliated to the British Association, the Hum British hum Humanist Association. And tonight he'll be presenting the humanist viewpoint on the existence of God. On my left hand side we have Shubham Swami. He's a travelling monk and was born in Hungary. He's been a spiritual leader in the International Society of the Krishna Consciousness for the last 30 years. And today he'll present the viewpoint of the Krishna Consciousness Society on the existence of God. Before the debate starts, I'd like to explain a few house rules. First of all, Dr. Stephen Law will have five minutes to present his case, at which point then Shrivan Swam will have five minutes to present his case. And again, it goes back to Dr. Stephen Law to question him and respond to Shrivan Swami's case and kind of raise questions and any viewpoints he wants to put across. And the same will happen for Shrivan Swami. At this point, it gets really interesting. And then the debate and discussion opens up to you guys. There'll be 40 minutes for you to kind of stand up and put any questions to either guest, or if you have a viewpoint that you just want to express, feel free and stand up. You'll be limited to probably two minutes, which I will call time, because we don't want it to extend so far, so I'm sure many of you have something to say. Okay, at which point, after the floor discussion of 40 minutes has ended, that each speaker will have five minutes each to sum up their case. At the end, we'll have a vote. Now, you can vote with Dr. Stephen Law, uh, Shivam Shwami, or I believe you can vote in abstention if you don't quite know where you stand on this case. So try not to sit on the fence and do put your three points somewhere. Okay, without any further ado, if Dr. Stephen Law is ready, I'd like to introduce Dr. Stephen Law to put up his case with the Human Association. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Right, well, <coughs> uh, I'm not a research fellow at this university, actually. Oh, Previously, as well, principal um, I'm here to uh, defend humanism, which is ironic because I'm not a psychologist, but I know what it is. Uh, I think I'll probably be really, really defending atheism, actually. So, so here goes. <laughs> uh, I think we are talking about, I'll assume that we are talking about a, a god, a being who is all powerful. He can do anything, he could even change the laws of nature if he so wished, and also uh, supremely benevolent. He's an all-good God. Um, most theists seem to think that this being uh, loves us as if we were his children. Now, um, I've only got five minutes, so I can't say very much. But what I'm, what I'm going to do is uh, just very briefly explain why I don't believe that there is any such being, why it strikes me as being rather a rather irrational thing to believe. Um, and then hopefully I'll get a chance to say some more positive things about atheism later on, because I don't think it is a wholly negative doctrine, but I'm going to have to inevitably start off with the negative stuff, so I'm sorry. <clears throat> um, it seems to me, first of all, that there's very little reason to believe that there is such an all-powerful sort of being. Um, many people think that there is evidence that there is such a being. Uh, you find um, design arguments very popular at the moment. Some people um, point to uh, things like the bacterial flagellum, and they say, look at that, only God can make one of those, because it's irreducibly complex. It's constructed of parts in such a way that if any one bit was removed, the entire thing would fail to function. Now, how could evolution, how could natural selection possibly explain the existence of something like the bacterial flagellum? Only God can make a bacterial flagellum. <coughs> Other people, uh, the same people, argue that um, the universe has been fine-tuned to produce conscious beings like ourselves. Um, that if the laws of nature had been only very slightly different, just a teeny weeny bit, if the levers that set it up had been tweaked just a tiny bit, the entire universe would have collapsed in on itself within microseconds or immediately uh, dissipated into a thin, sterile soup. Um, the chances of the leaders being set just so, so as to produce a stable universe capable of bringing forth life like this, unbelievably improbable. Therefore, it's reasonable to believe that there is some sort of being, some sort of architect, some sort of intelligence behind the universe. 
Now, I am not persuaded by any of those arguments for an intelligent designer. <coughs> My point here is that even if those arguments were good, which they're not, even if they were good arguments, they would establish at best only that the universe has some sort of intelligence behind it. They would not establish that that intelligence is good. They would not establish the existence of God. So we can debate, if you like, those kinds of design arguments, but notice that those arguments do not establish the existence of God as we introduced him right at the beginning of this discussion. Not only is there no good evidence for the existence of God, if you look around you, you will see that there is actually overwhelming evidence that there is no such creator as God with a capital G, and all good God, that's to say. Perhaps the universe was created by some sort of intelligent being, but either that intelligent being is not supremely benevolent and all good, and perhaps it's kind of morally indifferent or morally neutral, lacking in any moral properties at all, or possibly he's quite nasty and sadistic. <clears throat> if you look around, you will find unbelievable suffering, millions of years of animal suffering, human suffering, some of, sometimes free will gets the blame for that, but you can't possibly blame uh, free will for the black death, cancer, children die in the most horrendous, excruciating ways. <clears throat> Why does that kind of thing happen? The suggestion that this is the work of a, not only an all-powerful being, <clears throat> who could prevent it, if he's all-powerful, but a supremely good being, who loves us as if we were his children, is frankly, strikes me as being pretty irrational. And that's really why I don't believe in God. Now, there are various moves you can make here, which no doubt will be made, <laughs> and we'll talk about them. But it seems to me, prima facie, there's a very, very powerful case for saying that there really is no God. There may be perhaps some sort of intelligence behind the universe, I rather doubt it, but there certainly isn't a supremely benevolent or powerful being that's no more sensible a thing to believe, it seems to me, than that there is a supremely powerful all evil being. Who believes that there's a supremely powerful or evil being? Anybody? There's usually some good for saying that at this point. I think there have been one or two people in history that have believed that there is such a being. Of course, nobody believes it. You all think that it's a very silly thing to believe. Why is it a very silly thing to believe? Because, okay, because there is overwhelming evidence that even if there is a designer, a creator. He isn't all evil. Look around you, there's too much beauty in the world. There's too much goodness. There's, there are children, there are all things bright and beautiful. There are too many nice things in the world for it plausibly to be considered the work of an all-powerful, all-evil creator. And the, that's the reason I get, I'm guessing, most of you don't believe that there's such a being. That's the reason I don't believe in God. It's just as implausible to suppose that there's an all-powerful, all-good creator. Look around you. There's far too much suffering, far too much pain and anguish, clearly in the world, beyond our control, for the world to be plausibly considered the product of an all-powerful, all-good God. So I don't believe in the all-good, all-powerful <coughs> God, for the same reason that none of you believe in the all-powerful, all bad one. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Stephen Roll. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess at the outset I should point out that although I will speak pro-God, I'm not here to present proof that God exists, but rather to give evidence and a process by which individuals can verify for themselves that such a being does exist. Uh, in this, I would just like to define, and I think Stephen already has, uh, at the beginning, define what we're talking about when we're speaking about God. Uh, he is the origin of everything. Uh, in Vedanta Sutra, it's called Jamadhyasudhipaha. In other words, he's the source of everything. 
is a source both of the world around us as well as ourselves. Uh, he is a transcendent, transcendental, supreme being, and by nature of his infinite potencies and his infinite nature, he becomes uh, inaccessible solely to the empiric mind. Uh, how is he then to be understood? Well, there are generally two different processes of knowledge. One is the inductive and the other is the deductive. Briefly, deductive knowledge means knowledge that we accept from a higher or superior source and inductive knowledge is knowledge that we acquire through either our own experimentation, uh, our empirical process, uh, our own testing, somehow or another to try to verify. And when we are speaking about God, then the question becomes, is God subject to both of these processes uh, or one of them? And is God accessible through the inductive process? Uh, the answer that I will give, which is the answer which is based on the Vedic literatures, uh, which is the theological texts behind the Krishna consciousness movement, uh, says that no, God cannot be uh, understood uh, in this type of uh, inductive way. You cannot understand him by trying to ascend or conquer him because the equipment which we have is deficient. In other words, we do not have uh, sufficient intelligence. Uh, there are, for instance, four basic defects of any living entity. Uh, one is by which we generally acquire information. One is our senses. Uh, our senses have an inherent built-in imperfection. Uh, we have imperfect senses. We have, number two, the tendency to make mistakes. You probably everyone will agree with that. Whoever we are, we have a tendency to make mistakes. Number three is due to our identity with this body uh, and those things which relate to this body, we labor under misconceptions, which is called illusion. And then the fourth is sort of the sum package of those three, is that with all of these disqualifications, we tend to stand up and say, I know this, as if it's fact. And that fourth element is called a cheating, uh, cheating propensity. Everyone cheats, whether it's on our taxes or we claim to know more than what we do. Because of these four defects, therefore, the uh, process of ascending, this is called arova panta in Sanskrit, uh, or this inductive knowledge doesn't work. And therefore, anyone who tries to assess whether God exists or God exists by this process must come to the conclusion that he does not. That most, as Stephen pointed out, you may say, you can give arguments for law of necessity, God must exist because the universe is well structured, therefore if there's design, there must be a designer. And Stephen was mentioning that there may be some intelligence out there, whether it's a good intelligence or evil intelligence, but intelligence that is there. And of course intelligence may infer, and certainly does, that usually intelligence means an intelligent being. But still, that is not even if it were to give you the right uh, arrows or the right direction to infer that God does exist, it's not enough. The deductive process, that is when God actually reveals himself to us who have these limited faculties, that becomes a more realistic means by which we can know him because after all he is the authority on himself. Now the question is, does God actually reveal himself? Does he speak to us? Uh, the answer there, I would say, is yes. In the revealed scriptures of the world, God gives a basic map, a basic outline, how it is that we can approach him. And he gives generally a process or processes whereby which uh, he, we become open or accessible to that descent not only of knowledge but revelation is a standard word uh, that is used so by which God reveals himself to us we show our earnestness in wanting to actually know him so my summation or conclusion is that yes God is exists there is not only both evidence but proof for God 
But the evidence is this, you have to practice a spiritual science by which God will reveal himself to you, and then on an individual basis, every time one can realize for themselves the existence of God. For the Hare Krishna movement, that process of revelation takes place through the chanting of the holy names of God, the Hare Krishna mantra, which probably you've seen us do or heard us do. Thank you so much. Um, well, of course, it's, it's a well-known fact that our senses can deceive us. Stick a stick in water and it looks bent. You know. We know that we are subject to optical illusions. We do make mistakes. Actually, we don't just make mistakes when it comes to the empirical realm. We also make deductive mistakes. Uh, we make mistakes in our deductive reasoning too. Um, <clears throat> does it follow from the fact that we are subject to mistakes and um, prey to illusions and that our senses are not entirely reliable? Does it follow from that that they are incapable of providing us with knowledge? Well, I guess it depends what you mean by knowledge. Um, there's always the possibility of error, yes. But we can still have pretty good grounds for thinking that something is true on the basis of experience. If you reject that view, then you really are saying that science, and indeed all of the, all of, all of the empirical disciplines really, uh, cannot provide us with any knowledge at all. If you say anything that relies on the senses, you can't possibly, can't possibly provide you with knowledge, well then we are condemning all of the empirical sciences and medicine and goodness what else to the rubbish bin. Do you want to do that? I don't think so. I see, it seems to me that our senses are capable of providing us with pretty good grounds for thinking that certain things are true and other things are false. And uh, it doesn't seem to me a sensible thing to say that anything to, that any belief that we acquire that is based on the use of the senses is, it cannot possibly be knowledge and is not to be trusted. <coughs> Now, it seems to me that our senses, as I say, do provide us with pretty good grounds to suppose that there is no all-powerful, all-good God. And that, that was the evidence that I was appealing to to begin with. It's possible that I'm mistaken. It may be that I'm a, a brain in a glass vat <laughs> and that there is no empirical world out there at all and that it's all some sort of illusion. But uh, working on the assumption that you, know, you really are there and that there is a table here and so on, it seems to me that you know, there are things that we can know about the world around us, and what we've discovered about the world around us is pretty powerful evidence, not perhaps conclusive, but pretty powerful evidence that there is no God. In just the same way as there is pretty powerful evidence that there isn't an evil God, which is, of course, why none of you believe in an evil God. So it seems to me that we've got good evidence there, and we shouldn't just dismiss it with a wave of the, wave of the hand and say, oh, the senses, you can't trust them. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to uh, say is that if we're going to turn to revelation and personal experience, looking within in order to find out what's really true, <coughs> how do we know that that's going to be any more reliable than uh, our senses? At least with the senses you can cross-check them. How do we know that this faculty which we supposedly have, which hooks us up to the supernatural realm and we the existence of God. How do we know it's there at all? How does it work? How do we know that we can trust it? What's the evidence for it being trustworthy? Well, of course, it's going to be quite hard to establish that there is such a faculty. But in fact, we also have very powerful evidence that there ain't no such thing. Because if you look around the world at different times and different places, you will find that people have always appealed to revelation to back up their own particular religious belief, be it belief in one god or many gods, be they good gods or bad gods, Greek gods who are rather fickle and not always very pleasant, the Nordic gods. It's very odd, isn't it, that whenever people have a revelatory experience, it always turns out to fit in exactly with whatever religious belief, they always, they have already signed themselves up to. Why is it that Catholics never see Zeus? 
it seems to me that there's very, grand, very good grounds for supposing that this faculty, which so many religious people believe they have, is really not very reliable at all. So it seems to me that we have very good grounds for supposing that the faculty that we'd be encouraged to trust here is not at all reliable, and yet the faculties that actually are capable of providing with, with pretty good grounds for supposing that the world is a particular kind of way, and that we all rely on every day of our lives, and that given us <coughs> medicine and all of these other fantastic things, that we should simply chuck all that away and say, oh, that's all rubbish because it can't give us knowledge. That seems to me not to be the rational way to approach this debate. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Law. <laughs> now I'm going to pass over to Sri Ramaswamy to respond to Dr. Law's question. Yes, uh, thank you, Stephen. I, uh, just as a point of clarification, that the uh, assertion, my assertion, that uh, our senses are imperfect and therefore don't give us perfect knowledge doesn't mean that they don't give us any knowledge. <coughs> they do give us, and neither are we proposing that the obvious achievements uh, of particularly the previous century in terms of technology and everything else uh, is doesn't exist. It does exist and it certainly has its assets and uses for uh, humanity. However, because the senses are imperfect, they can't give you perfect knowledge. Uh, and not only can't they give you perfect knowledge, but the senses are also limited. Uh, our ability to see what's going on outside this room, we cannot see. Even our uh, auditory faculties are limited. If sound vibration is too high, if it's too low, we can't hear it. So despite the fact that someone may be saying something, our assumption may be that no one is saying anything, but maybe a dog could hear. So the uh, point which I was making up is that everything should be thrown out by no means. Uh, that's not the assertion at all. But rather that if we are limited in our scope and sensory perception limits our scope, then it becomes very difficult for the limited to understand the unlimited. And therefore, as your second point uh, was also well taken, or at least partially, there's a common phenomenon within all religions because there's no other way that a superior being or a more extensive entity thing can be known by a subordinate one unless it's through a process of revelation. Now, how is revelation verifiable? I mean, revelation is not such a supernatural mystical phenomenon. Uh, it takes place every day here in this auditorium. There's a teacher here who reveals knowledge to the student. The students can verify that knowledge. But the whole process of education is based upon someone who is more learned, who has more knowledge, and he reveals or he communicates that knowledge uh, to someone who's in a lesser position. The process of understanding God uh, is in a similar category. In other words, God is not only just a professor, not only someone who knows a little more, not only someone a little greater, but if we are limited, and certainly we are limited entities, uh, if we start with the definition which I started, he's an unlimited supreme being, then from the start, you have no access to approach and know that unlimited being, regardless of what type of limited faculties we have, whether they're 75% perfect or 99% perfect, or even if they're 100% perfect. Even if the senses are 100% perfect, they're still limited. And therefore, to know something which is both superior to us, or both beyond our capacity to comprehend, there needs to be an aspect of revelation, which is just part and parcel of the entire educational process. And revelation, at least in that point, is uh, an education. So the fact that it's common to all theology is because all theology, all religions must have that as a common parameter, the subject matter they're talking about requires that, namely God. And as far as uh, how is it verifiable, uh, the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna talks about pratyaksha uh, In In others, there is also pratyaksha. How do we verify knowledge if we acquire now? We have a scientific process, has these three elements. We have a hypothesis, and we have an experiment, and then ultimately you can come to a conclusion, have you actually verified 
So spiritual life also, as well as the existence of God, must also be verifiable. It's verifiable on the basis of what the definition of God is. One more minute. Uh, on, the, on the basis of what uh, the definition of God is, uh, what he looks like, what his energies are, and if these are verifiable through also sensory perception, but a different type of sensory perception. In other words, these senses function very well in a receptive <laughs> mode. Uh, they function very well in a deductive. In an inductive mode, they become very inefficient. So we do have uh, a facility to hear, to understand. If I say this is a microphone and someone repeats that, that is transmitting perfect knowledge, albeit it's done with the same imperfect <coughs> senses. So it's also verifiable, and both all religions also give means by which revelation can be verified, which is not very much dissimilar with the way our current process of verification of the scientific process takes place through experimentation. The question is, are we willing to perform the experiment? And if we are willing to perform the experiment, then to that we can come to the stage of verifying God's existence. Thank you, Sri Ramaswamy. Questions to either speakers or to stand up and give us your viewpoints. If I see a raise of hands, anybody who'd like to have any questions, please. Sarah, I see you in the audience. Okay. Um, State your name, please. My name is Brad. Um, okay. Uh, it appears to me that if everything is limitless and endless, and if God is this being that is everything, then how, like, I, I don't feel, and it came in a few minutes late, but I don't feel like um, uh, the doctor has actually considered, <coughs> Stephen, has considered uh, what that really means in terms of if, something, if um, something is endless and infinite and everything, yeah. then it includes ourselves and it is everything. Yeah. So uh, what I'm saying is that, like, uh, if you break down matter, to its smallest constituents, um, you find energy, little strands of energy. Um, that's what I've been told, that's what I've been led to believe. And these uh, strands of energy uh, react um, under the will of, if, if scientists are looking at something in that kind of depth, it reacts under the will of the scientists. Uh, experiments shown that. Yeah, I'm not a physicist, so I'm not really qualified okay, to but, but, but you comment would've... on... on uh... No, not, and neither, neither, neither would I, but, I, but the point I'm trying to make is that would you agree that everything is basically made up of energy? I don't really know what that means. <laughs> Given that uh, matter is energy, I guess it's true. And you present it square. Yeah. yeah, and so Where from, are we going? <laughs> from, from, from that understanding, I deduce God to, when you say God is everything, God is literally all the energy that can be perceived or not perceived. Okay, yeah, so he exists. Well, no, no, it's just, it's just a definition. It's literally just a definition. But, look, okay. but it, looking at it under that definition, everything that... Um, I didn't catch your name either. Swami. Swami. Everything that <laughs> Swami has said holds, holds, no, holds true within, within that definition of God. I'm not, saying, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily saying you know, one thing is right, one thing is... But it's yeah. just a comment to make that everything you've said, I, I, I feel, holds true under that definition. Would that be correct? Could I clarify? Yeah. Brad has a, a good point and presenting this one aspect, but in the ultimate issue, everything is reduces down to energy. And God is everything. On the other hand, there's another aspect of God which is a localized personal aspect. So although God is everything, that doesn't mean that everything altogether becomes God. But God also has an individual identity. So in our definition of God, which was before you came in, was that God is the supreme being. He's the supreme being, and everything that exists is manifestation of his diverse and separated energies. Right. Separated energies. <coughs> yeah, like yeah, okay. I'm speaking and it's on the microphone, so that's a separated energy. It's separate from me, but it's, in one sense, non different than me. Right. So both those aspects. Then maybe, Stephen, you want to continue. Thanks. Thank you. 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 Thank
<coughs> I'm not entirely sure I know what we're talking about, actually. Um, no, no, but I'll say something very uh, briefly. Uh, well, people define God in, in many different ways, and the way that we originally defined it, which we sort of agreed, really, was that uh, God is all-powerful and all-good. Um, Source of everything. Yeah. Now, other people would de just define God as energy, or the laws of nature, or the universe, or... Now, if you define God that way, then, of course, we can all agree that God exists and just go now. <laughs> um, but the claim is much more specific than that. It's that um, there is an all-powerful and all-good creator. Um, and that, I don't see how that follows from what you've said so far about being... Because remember, we also have this alternative hypothesis, or there's a range of hypotheses, actually. But the alternative is... There is a, 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 an infinite God, infinitely bad, an evil God, okay? Um, that's a, a, a hypothesis which perhaps we should consider too. Now, saying that, you know, God is everything is just as consistent with that hypothesis as it is with the all-good God hypothesis. And yet, you want to go with the good one and you think the bad one's silly. Well, I'm not sure, do you? I mean... Well, so do you want to just take morality out of the equation so far as, as, as God is concerned? That, that, would, that would go back to the point that was raised about um, having a hypothesis about something, experimenting and then drawing conclusions, wouldn't it? <coughs> on, how, on how, as individual beings, we see that, that everything, how we view that everything, and how we relate, interrelate with that everything. Yeah, I'm... I'm I'm not, I mean, we're just confused. We seem to be operating now with an incredibly thin notion of God, uh, in which all the moral attributes have been stripped out. And of course, we, we right at the beginning, were committed to something much more substantial than that, an all-good God. That's the claim, that there is an right. all-powerful, all-good God. Um, now, if you define God as everything, I'm, I'm not quite, we can all agree then that there is one, because there is everything. But uh, I'm not quite sure how that gives us any justification whatsoever for supposing, oh, and he's all good as well, as opposed to, oh, and he's all evil as well. Yeah, well, that would, be down, that would be down to the experimentation and, uh, and under the parameters that you set for yourself and how you draw those conclusions, surely. Okay, well, the, from, the, from the observations and experiments that I've conducted, it seems to me that the evidence points well away from there being either an all-powerful, all-good God yeah. or an all-powerful, all-evil God. It seems to me that both hypotheses are very obviously contradicted by the facts, the very obvious facts around us. They're both clearly pretty irrational things to believe. It's, and I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not saying I can prove there is no God. I'm saying it's a balance of probabilities. It's a question of how you weigh up the evidence. And the fact is that we have very, very little evidence that there is any such being. And we have very powerful evidence but that there is no such being. Um, and so for that reason, I don't believe in God, for the, for the same reason that I don't believe in the evil God, or Santa Claus, or fairies, or any of these other things. And there is, just to add one, sorry, I'm going on a bit now, so, sorry, there is one, there is one thing to be cautious of, and that is playing the mystery card, the trumping mystery card, when we get into trouble with our particular belief system. Because there's a very strong tendency, there's a very strong tendency to say, but it's all a mystery, and God works in mysterious ways, as if that were actually a virtue of the theory, as if, oh, now we're really getting somewhere. But remember that just as we can try and deal with objections to the good God hypothesis by saying that he's mysterious, and of course we can't possibly be expected to understand how his brain works, because he's got an infinite mind. Well, you can do all of that with the evil God hypothesis, and this, really, this universe really is all for the worst, right? It's just that we can't possibly understand how. It's all a mystery. Or well, there really are fairies at the bottom of the garden, but I admit that the evidence doesn't really suggest that there are, but you know, fairies work in mysterious ways. <coughs> Playing the mystery card, it seems to me, is, 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 is intellectually dishonest, frankly. Okay, <laughs> just, 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 very, just very quickly, just very quickly, sure, I understand. Just very quickly, just to, just to uh, finish with that. Um, basically, what you're saying from your understanding and experimentation and from your feelings on the matter, because you can't prove, prove that, or you think it unlikely that there is um, either an all good God or an all evil God, you say, oh, although um, we can understand God to be everything, I don't really have a viewpoint on it, and I'm playing the mystery card because um, it hasn't led me to either one of these particular 
conclusions, and so I'm just going to say, oh, well, there must be no God, even though you said, well, under, under the uh, parameters which we set it being everything, there clearly is a God. No, that's not what I'm saying. Do you want me to say it again? It seems to me overwhelmingly unlikely that there's an all good God. It seems to me overwhelmingly unlikely that there's an evil God. If you define God as everything, then I'll, I will agree with you that there is a God. But then we all will. <laughs> okay, um, thank you, Stephen. That's this gentleman that's fine here. Question? Hi. Um, I'd just like to ask, uh, or make a point rather, about the discussion of whether or not God exists or not. It's quite different to the discussion of who God is and the qualities of God. So, for example, if I were to hear a knock on this, the door of my auditor- of this auditorium, I would know that definitely there's something there, or someone there, who made the sound of the knock. But I wouldn't be able to identify it because I can't see him. You know, was there a man, a woman, a dog, or the wind? Yeah. So I can't, I can't just by knowing something exists, I can't um, know the qualities of that, of that existence. Yeah. So I think the, the, the discussion has been somewhat convoluted when we discuss the qualities of God as the same as God himself, uh, and he exists. If we're discussing whether God exists or not, I think there needs to be a very clear rational proof of his existence. And I think if you're, if you're saying that God is everything, then you... Yeah. Not you, but yeah. anyone who is. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you're saying that God is everything, like, like Mr. Swami said, and, and God is everywhere. I think that needs to be justified by some proof. Um, so, so I'd like to hear, you know, what Mr. Swami has to say regarding the proof for God is everything and everywhere. Because it's actually a slight failure in this argument, uh, if I were just made uh, continue. Because if you say God is everything, and you maintain that everything is the creation of God, yeah, everything that exists that we can sense is the creation of God. But if you say that everything that exists is part of God, then you're making God the sum of limited beings. So if you're part of God, I'm part of God, there's six billion other people who are part of God, as well as certain galaxies and, and, and you know uni- and the particles of universe, you're making God the sum of limited things. And no matter how many limited things you add together, it will always end up being limited. So by saying everything is God, you're actually limiting the scope of God himself, or herself, or whatever, maybe. I'll respond to the first part of your question, uh, and then the second. Uh, I, I also have difficulty with Stephen's argument of there not being a God because he can't be good, and his not being evil uh, is maybe not tenable, although some people may present that. Uh, I thought your argument about the knock on the door was going to go in a different direction. In other words, if someone's knocking on the door, you assume that there is someone there. The question is, there's someone knocking on the door. Whether he's good or not, that's a separate issue. But it's not that, well, if he's a good person, then it can't be anybody, it must be the wind. And if he's a bad person, then, then it's the person. So that's a secondary issue already. The primary issue is, does God exist? And whether he's good or bad, although God is good, if we see simply in terms of the technical nature of his ability to create, it's certainly very efficient, very perfect in all ways, how he would become a imperfect God, because badness and its imperfection that is then contradictory to everything that we see around us as part of the creation. But even that, we could get to that argument, which then whether God is good or not. But the point being is that, does God exist? And then if he's good or not, that then becomes the next question. Now, what is God? Is God everything? I mentioned that God is not everything. And everything altogether is not God. God is a person. And everything is God's energy. But, God is non-different in his energy. So in one sense, everything is God. (laughs) Just like, I'm going to give you an example, just like we have a prime minister in this country, and that prime minister is a person who sits in 10 Downing Street, and he's very much localized there. And yet everything that goes on, whether it be from the postal service to the police department, the military, and everything else, 
is going on through his energies, or we say his ultimate authority. We use the word energy in a mechanistic sense, in a political sense we can say it's his authority. So the postmaster general is not the prime minister, but at the same time he's empowered to perform a particular service <coughs> under that authority. In the same way, everything that exists is God's energy. Because by definition, nothing can be separate from God. On the other hand, there's a difference between God the person and God his impersonal energies. So when you put everything all together, everything all together doesn't add up to God. Everything in the material world simply adds up to the sum total of God's material potencies, which is just a small fraction of his potency. So in this sense, when we're talking to separate the potent from the potency, potency only exists when there's a potent person. That's how we have, we have electricity here. Electricity doesn't exist without people. And the ultimate issue, although it's an impersonal energy, there has to be someone back there in some generator or some uh, nuclear reactor who's pushing a button and supervising and making sure that we get electricity, and obviously who's also designed it. So I'm just talking about the concept of God that I'm discussing. This is, this is the definition of God. We're talking about who's a person, a good person. And aside from that, the universe is his energy, his potency. Can I come back? Because I also have a question for um, I have a question for hands up. Your argument seems to rest very much on like drawing experiences from like a world of appearance or a phenomenal world and applying those to like a transcendent or noumenal realm. <coughs> but um, how do you answer Kant's like uh, critique of pure reason in which he said that that application of reason on the transcendent is, is like quite futile? You know, you're like drawing experiences saying that from what I experience here, I, I conclude that there can't be something existing beyond this world. You know, but isn't, isn't that a bit sort of like... No, that's, that's not quite what I said. I didn't say... <coughs> I didn't conclude that there was nothing beyond this world. Um, well, I said it... Well, but you didn't say anything about anything like beyond this world from, from what you experience here. How is it actually possible to do that, to talk about like a noumenal world? Which would work... You know, where, where, where exist or yeah, well, you can, as I you say, you, you, you can just play the mystery card and say, it's all the mystery. Um, but then we can't say anything about it at all. Uh, but if you say, oh no, there's a personality back there that's all powerful and all good, which is, remember what this debate is supposed to be about, that particular claim, um, then it seems to me that if we look around us, we find pretty powerful evidence that there is actually no such. Did you mention this evidence? Because you keep talking about there being evidence. Okay, well, you know, <laughs> there's the Black Death, there's cancer, there's hemorrhoids. There are many, many, you know, it's true, many things are you know, bright and beautiful, but not all of them. There are plenty of things which are dark and dirty and despicable and ugly and vile, and <clears throat> it's just not plausible that an all-powerful being who can prevent there being such things, and an all-good being who loves us as if we were his children, would inflict that kind of horrendous, <coughs> pointless, needless agony on generation after generation of animals and on human beings, it simply doesn't make very much sense. It is powerful, prima facie, very powerful evidence that there is no such being. No, that's true. Now, You're talking about goodness. You're not talking about the being again. We're getting back to the Okay, now, I said right at the beginning, if you want to talk about there might be a being back there, but let's not talk about his moral properties, well then that's an entirely different debate. We agreed right at the beginning that we were talking about the all-powerful, all-good. You accept that there may be a being with a person. Yes, and I said right at the beginning that we can look at arguments for the existence of some sort of intelligence or being behind the universe, but that is not the debate here. The debate here is that not only is there such a being, that being is all good, and that is patently not true, it strikes me, and just the same way as it is patently not true that that being, if he exists, is all evil. If you take the first test, uh -huh. that there is a being, then 
we could argue the next step. How is it possible that if there's bad things in the world, which is a very relevant argument, that God could still be good? But that's, the, that's already the secondary. That's part B. Once part A has to be there, unless there's a being, you can't even argue whether he's good or not. <laughs> well, that's true. But we can also, I mean, the, the moves that we can make to defend belief in a good God, and of course you might defend, you might think of free will, or oh, this is a veil of uh, soul creation, or there are all sorts of moves that people make. <clears throat> Actually, you can make all of those moves in order to defend belief in an evil God. I mean, I'll do it for you now, okay? There really is an evil God, <clears throat> supremely evil, supremely powerful. He's out there. Why is there so much, why is there so much good in the world, then? Why does God um, give us beautiful, loving children? Why does he allow people to do good things? Why does he do that? Well, God gave us free will. The evil God gave us free will. <clears throat> and he gave us free will, knowing that we have largely weak and selfish natures. He gave us free will, the, the, the opportunity to do, to do good or bad. It's our choice. And sometimes, unfortunately, from, from his point of view, we do choose to do good things. However... More often than not, we always so choose to do bad things. In addition, before we do the bad things, we agonise about it beforehand, and we experience the exquisite torture of temptation. And then afterwards, when we've done the bad thing, we, have, we experience the exquisite agony of guilt. So we do the bad things, more often than not. We also go through experiences which we could not, which are horrendous, which we could not possibly have unless we had been given free will. So you see, free will explains why it is that God allows us to do good things. He gave us free will, and, he, and it turns out that that means that sometimes we will do good things. But the evil that free will allows, the degree of suffering, the acute suffering that free will bring, brings in the form of, uh, of temptation and guilt and so on, far outweighs that good. That's an example of a reverse theodicy, if you like. You probably recognise it. You've heard the other version, the mirror version, which is used to defend belief in good God. We can make those kind of moves on both sides. It seems to me that just as that, that reverse theodicy in order to defend belief in an evil God, I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? I mean, as I say, who here believes in an all-powerful, all-evil God? Nobody. Who here is convinced by that pathetic, feeble excuse uh, as a defence of belief in an all-powerful, all-evil God? Nobody. Uh, and the same, of course, should go for the uh, free will defence of belief in a, in a good God. No, Both all. hypotheses are equally irrational. <clears throat> OK, thank you. I might get quite a few hands up. So, Lady, in a green jumper right back, just had a hand from the beginning. Um, well... Now I have a few questions. It was from before. It's not addressing the things that you just said about the all powerful all evil. Um, my question was when you said that the proof was that all the evil in the world, how is it that all the good in the world, it, like it didn't make sense to me that you said the extensive proof you had, you said a few times that you had experimented. And that was why you determined that there was no God. And then when he asked you, what is this uh, proof that you keep talking about? You said all the evil, the black plague, and all the black death. And I guess I'm, I just, that's not, how is that substantial proof, scientifically speaking? I mean, you go on and on oh, about how whatever this philosophy <coughs> may not be scientific, but it's, that doesn't sound scientific to me at all. Because right. there's death or because there's sadness or evil, but that's proof, that's substantial. No, no, I never said proof. No, 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 no. I never said it's 100% proof. Um, I said it makes it overwhelmingly <coughs> unlikely that there is any such being. Um, it's very powerful evidence, is what I said. How is that powerful evidence? But what's the logic that makes it powerful? I don't, right I don't now, the logic powerful doesn't make it powerful. Well, okay. <coughs> this is why it's powerful evidence. So? Oh, Okay, it's powerful evidence because look, if there's an all, if there's an all powerful, all good God, He's all powerful, so He can prevent our suffering. He could have created a world without cancer and hemorrhoids. He, he's also all good and loves us as if we were His children. Now, if I was a, a father of children, 
And I would move let them transfer hemorrhoids on my child if I was if it was within my power to prevent it, and I loved my child, which I do. It's just the suggestion that you know there is a being who is all powerful and all God. The suggestion that he would make a universe like this, which although it does have beauty and lovely things in it, also contains the most vile and disgusting things too. The suggestion that an all-good, all-powerful God would create that is, is, is deeply implausible, isn't it? Isn't it? Can we, just, yeah. can we just hear from God's side, at least represent him? <laughs> <laughs> but before I do, just to talk a little about the goodness, the good God, and the bad things disqualify there being a good God. I, I just wanted a simple question, maybe yes or no. Do living entities have free will? I don't actually know the answer to that question. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the answer. But let me, now let me just make yeah. a point. The, uh, the point was, is that living entities do have a free will. We have a legal system worldwide that's based on the fact that they do. Therefore, they're both punished and rewarded accordingly. Uh, we there'd, do still have, much, there'd still be point in punishing and rewarding even if we don't have free will. Um, and you, you can't punish someone if they don't have free will. Uh, it may not be just, but it might be quite useful if you want to control their behaviour and the behaviour of other people and so on. There may be all sorts of good reasons for having a judicial then you system. Better start to change, then you better change the whole system, not to the justice system, but to the injustice system. Maybe it's the wrong way. Anyway, sorry, Andrew. <laughs> but let me go to the point. The point being is that God creates a world, we need to, in order to understand the concept of free will and the fact that living entities are able to change their destiny, one needs to have a clearer perspective of, which I don't think they're fairly representing, what is the function of this world? Is this world the ultimate realm of existence, or it's a temporary realm of existence? What the very nature of the world is, the nature of the world is that it's temporary. Now there are certain things like cancer, hemorrhoids and others, which are products sometimes of, and other diseases which are products of being a temporary world, because the body by its very nature deteriorates, it's a machine. The other, and we may say, well why does God create things like that? But that comes back to the issue, the discussion that that is the nature of this creation is that it's temporary as opposed to being an eternal realm, which also identifies with the eternal identity of the living entity itself or the soul. And uh, the uh, other aspect of uh, the world is that. Point. aside from the uh, temporary nature of the world by which everything deteriorates, is that God also gives certain rules by which people can live in such a way that they can minimize both their own suffering, just like we do have a legal system. If people follow the legal system, they save themselves from a lot of suffering. Our experience is that human beings, because they do have free will, they transgress both God's laws in terms of their behavior with each other, in terms of their behavior with themselves. And naturally, in a mechanistic world that we live in, uh, then there becomes, just like when you drive a car in the wrong direction, uh, if you drive around the wrong side of the road, you immediately come into some kind of difficulty or some kind of chaos. So immediately there then becomes suffering. The suffering does not necessarily necessitate back to how can God be cruel. It is on the shoulders of human beings who do have free will, that they have to be aware of just the nature of the world, as well as the way in which human beings are meant to function in this world, to live in a way when they can live with minimal suffering. And there is a process of living with minimal suffering, but that once again has to conform to the laws of God. Now that's powerful evidence if you want to also pursue it in further depth, uh, and, but it requires further experimentation, which I would beg to differ whether you've actually performed the experiment to prove God, at least not the experiment that I would suggest that you perform. Uh, it would be a, 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 an experiment that requires uh, quite vigorous and rigorous uh, discipline, and it would also require following a certain pattern or a certain process, which you does have uh, experimentally verifiable results. Um, can I move back to the floor? As James was a black cat, um, I, think, I think most of this discussion from Stephen's side is basically saying that 
um, there's a lot of suffering in the world. Okay, so they can't be God. That's pretty much just been the underlying thing that's been coming from yourself. Um, I was just wondering if uh, Shiva and Swami would elaborate on like the law of karma and how and the Kali Yuga, without trying to preach the Vedic philosophies, if you could elaborate on that and try and explain why there is actually suffering, why people when they're born, I don't know, babies die very early. Going to your point, you know, those reactions, what you're doing, um, like you may drive on opposite side of the road. <coughs> Fine, it's in your case, it's in your hands what you're doing. But in the case of a baby, a baby's born and uh, all of a sudden it has some sort of disease and it dies. Obviously, it doesn't have much free will in that sort of case. But could you just elaborate on the law of karma and how it sort of coincides and sort of gives understanding to why there is so much suffering in the world and also elaborate on these sort of Briefly, <laughs> and, and just in the context of uh, what I mentioned earlier, that the nature in which the world is created, and, and that is, you know, Newtonian physics says for every action there's an equal opposite reaction. So the fact you touch fire, you get burnt, you, you, you suffer. Uh, that is whether it's done due to ignorance, or it's done to a mistake, or it's done to free will. That's uh, maybe a different case. How living entities suffer without any previous history of action is previous in terms of what we perceive in this one particular lifetime. Uh, rather than uh, concluding that there is no possibility of someone having pre uh, had a previous life, if we actually go along with the laws of cause and effect by which this world um, functions, then by necessity there must be some particular cause by which some effect is taking place, even if you put aside the whole concept of God, because that is how things are working in this world. This is a causal reality that we live in, and whenever we see any reaction, we must see that there must be a cause. The fact that we don't see it or we don't have immediate visible evidence for that. Why is it that a baby dies at a young age? Or why is it that uh, other helpless entities suffer for some particular uh, cause? It means that there must have been some cause at some past time. Otherwise, put the theistic argument aside, you still haven't answered that. And to just say that it just happened by chance, that still doesn't fit in to the world that we live in where things don't happen by chance. Everything happens because there's a particular reason. And, and that's the nature of the, even the mechanistic aspect of the world that we live in. So this law of karma uh, that was being referred to means just that, is that for every action, there is a reaction. If one perceives a reaction at the present time, it means that there was an action at some particular time which we either may not be witness to at the present time or don't, can't even necessarily understand, but we can infer that they must be, because how else do things happen in this world? something more. Okay. Um, yes. People have taken refuge in the image of God, whatever it is, actually, for thousands of years, if you will. Um, and throughout the sufferings that you referred to, it was a ray of hope, quite likely. And um, I'm just wondering, why would you want to prove that that ray of hope doesn't exist? I'm just asking, what, why do you think our lives would be better if we wouldn't have anything up there. Not the slightest reason for thinking that it is true. And in fact, it seems to me that belief in the transcendental realm 
I, look, I'm not going to go up to some poor old lady that believes in God who's in my deathbed and say, Oi, you. It's a load of rubbish, you know. <laughs> You're not going anywhere. This is the end. I'm not going to do that. That would be cruel and heartless. But uh, assuming that none of you are on, knocking on death's door, it seems to me that actually it's important that we do think, at least think critically and carefully about these things and not just get swept along by emotion and wishful thinking and the fact that there are lots of other people around us that are all going, oh, yes, it's really exciting. Uh, but just take a step back and just think about it carefully. And it seems to me that when you do that, really, it turns out to be a bit like believing in Santa, frankly. It does. I mean, that's how it's tried to be. Uh, I, now, you can say, well, there may be Santa. And, uh, you know, Santa's mysterious, and you can't know everything, can you? And it's true, I don't know everything, I make mistakes, and but it seems to me that the evidence is, the burden of proof, remember, is on those who think that there is more, right? The burden of proof is on them. The burden of proof of evidence of coming up with grounds is on them to show that it is true that there are fairies or Santa or evil God or a good God. It is not on me to prove that there is no such thing. And actually, they can't come up with those good grounds. All of this talk about this scientific evidence for experimental methods. I don't think so. And also, there's powerful empirical evidence. I don't call it proof, but powerful empirical evidence that there's no such being. So it's, it's <coughs> I still today not uh, in terms of the concept of proving. Yes, when someone says God exists, you must prove it. For someone to say God doesn't exist, you also have to prove that. In other words, you have to. No, you don't. You just have to come up with pretty good grounds for something. No, no, no. Excuse me. Proof requires evidence, and you have to argue evidence in a conclusive way. It's equally you have to be equally conclusive to disprove something as to actually prove it. I don't claim to have proved that there is no God. But, uh, fine, I'm just saying that as far as the evidence, the empirical evidence that there isn't God, uh, the, the statement in itself is contradictory. Empiricism now neither will prove God nor will disprove God, because God is beyond empiricism. If you want to prove God, there is experiment. You're saying that it doesn't work. I say it does work. I say it because I perform the experiment. Now, my question is, if you want to be scientific, I give you the experiment. Are you going to do it or not do it? And then tell me that you just do it. Yes, but which authority are you going to listen to? Is this, this particular authority, or the authority of the ancient Greek? You could try any uh, or the Well, because they all contradict each other, unfortunately. They, some say there are many gods, some say there is one god, some Buddhists say there is no god. Um, they contradict each other in the details as well. Um, now, you can strip out all the details and say, well, there's something there, but it turns out to be vanishingly thin, there's just you know, something. Um, so, you know, if you, if by all means appeal to authority, but I, I need to know why your authority is the right one to listen to, and how do you know that it's the right one to listen to, and how do you know that those other authorities are no good, the ones that you push to one side? On the basis of seeing the claims they make and if the claim is true. 
So you can look, again, let's say devoting your whole life to that would be um, you know, too much to do straight away, to just base it on faith. But there's other things, there's other claims made by, by scriptures that might be true already, that you can already verify. So on that basis, you have some sort of That's how you should go about it. Yeah, weigh out the evidence. Think about it carefully, critically. Yeah. Oh, Thank you, Stephen. I'm sorry, that's the end of the discussion. I'm sorry I didn't get round to everybody. We've been pressing for time. And now, at the speech, we're going to take into account all your questions and points raised into the summation speeches. And Swan is going to start first. We have five minutes. <coughs> the, uh, yeah, the argument that God can't exist because there's bad, it's not a good <coughs> argument. Uh, it's not a good argument because uh, it doesn't disqualify the fact that God does exist, although I would not support the concept of a bad God. Uh, the concept that uh, God is good, or at least Stephen, for instance, uh, Stephen had uh, made the concession that there may be intelligence, uh, intelligence certainly indicates person, personality, uh, at least in terms of the experience that uh, we have, we equate the two things. And if the intelligence which creates the size or the extent uh, of the creation that we see indicates a large creation, the uh, large intelligence, that, that that intelligence would be evil seems extremely inconsistent if we're talking about what we see, as I mentioned earlier, with all of the order, uh, all of the structure, all of the perfection which is there from the atom up, up to the macroscopic up until the universal level. There is actually order so that God then all of a sudden would be both whimsical and disorderly, uh, goes contrary to the message which is there within his creation. And it also makes for quite irresponsible humanity because ultimately humanity then fails to take responsibility for the fact that either it is not going to adhere to the instructions of God or the laws of nature, and simultaneously is not willing to take responsibility for its own evil deeds, which often the argument may come that it is in the name of God that people have committed so many atrocities, but the issue is that it is people who have committed the atrocities. What their arguments are uh, is a in one sense, a secondary issue, the main people who are responsible for the atrocities uh, are the uh, people. We've uh, explained or discussed uh, the laws of karma. In terms of empirical evidence that God doesn't exist, such evidence doesn't exist because God is not subject to empiricism, uh, as I mentioned, and therefore neither you can prove that he exists empirically, neither you can disprove you may have some inference, you may infer that God exists, and then you may want to infer that on the basis of bad things, uh, God doesn't exist. But it's not a good uh, argument, uh, because the inference that it does exist, uh, as Stephen began, by the law of necessity, and how else will you explain creation, how else will you explain order, uh, it is a much more stronger. But the ultimate evidence is neither this type of argument or that type of argument or even this debate. The ultimate evidence will only be for those individuals who personally actually take up the science of spiritual life, who take up the science of devotion. And they may be, as they're described in one scripture or another scripture, the details may vary, but the ultimate principle will be to follow the laws of God, to learn how to love God, to perform that type of purificatory activity uh, by which one qualifies oneself to know God and to see God, uh, unless one actually performs that type of activity and the qualifications then become faith and devotion, there is no, we can continue and in the next 10,000 years they will continue. Those who perform the experiment, they don't have to argue, you don't have to convince them. Either those who are believe in God but don't perform the uh, experiment, and those who don't believe in God and don't perform the experiment will continue to be a subject of uh, argument. But ultimately, we need to consider for ourselves, do we really want to actually prove this for ourselves, 
by actually performing an experiment which may be recommended in one of the world's many scriptures and ultimately devote, my, uh, uh, devote myself to that process which gives the proper scientific result. And, as Stephen said, one should be discriminating. One should actually judge and see what is the uh, proposal, uh, what is the proposition which every scripture gives and what is the scriptural evidence uh, and the process behind it to substantiate that a proper experiment and conclusion can be reached. Well, look, I, I, I think that, uh, generally speaking, the, the, the people in the um, Christian movement that I've met have been you know, warm, nice, good hearted people. And um, I, I applaud that. Seems to me a very good thing, often much nicer than that's true. Um, but is that the experimental evidence? I don't know. Is that the experimental evidence? Experimental evidence supposing that their belief about a more powerful God is true? Um, no, I don't think it is. I mean, the fact that uh, certain beliefs make us behave better um, does not necessarily give us reason for supposing that those beliefs are true. In fact, it really doesn't give us much. Uh, reason for supposing that those beliefs are true. Um, I would like some, part of me would like to believe in God, you know, an all good, all powerful being. It's a very attractive belief. Um, but I, I just can't see how it really could be true. I don't claim to have proved that uh, there is no God, but it does seem to me a, a, a pretty irrational thing to believe. If you like, there's a scale of reasonableness. And up here, there's you know the belief that there's a trees outside, and a little bit further down, there's the, there's a belief that uh, Paris exists, and then a bit further down, there's the belief that electrons exist, and then that there's extraterrestrial life, and then down here, there's the belief that fairies exist, and that Delvis is alive and well and living in Sydney. Okay. Now the question is, where on this scale is belief in an all-powerful, all-good, all-good God? Where should we place that belief? And it seems to me that it's pretty low down on the scale, frankly. It is not a particularly reasonable thing to believe because we have very little in the way of good grounds for supposing that there is such a being and we have pretty good evidence that there is no such being. Now, you may say, well, it's not proof. It's not 100% proof. But, you know, we haven't got 100% proof that electrons exist. We haven't got 100% proof that there are no fairies at the bottom of the garden. But it is still, these are still extremely sensible things for you to believe. And it would be extremely irresponsible of you, rationally speaking, to believe the opposite, it seems to me. So that's why I don't believe in God. I have every respect for those who do. Um, I think many of them are good, noble people. Mind you, plenty of people who don't believe in God are good, noble people. Um, there is one thing that I would add, just because inevitably the thing you notice, you always come across as kind of really negative. And I just want to say something positive <coughs> about it. Um, people often think that if you're an atheist, you must inhabit an incredibly dry and barren universe, a universe without meaning, <coughs> without any purpose to it. And I really don't accept that. I mean, it seems to me that even if you take out the, the supernatural layer that so many people want to add to the universe, it seems that, you know, we have, I mean, I'm constantly filled with a sense of awe and wonder by the physical universe, by its fantastic beauty and its intricacy. Um, I'm constantly do, moved by, you know, an appreciation of, of the natural world around me, of animals and trees and flowers and so on. Um, I'm struck by the astonishing resilience and nobility of human beings, but also by their depravity on occasion. Um, I'm, I've got a deep love for my, my family and my friends around me, and I'm struck by the miracle of birth, and I think I'm under a great obligation to help other people. <clears throat> I feel that very strongly. But all of that, all of that is enough for me. I don't need to add on any supernatural stuff. It seems to me that that should be enough for you. 
I don't think you need to add on this extra airy fairy supernatural stuff in order to somehow give it all some point or purpose. It's already got a point and a purpose. It's enough point and purpose for me. I think it should be enough for you. And uh, so that's my, my positive case for being an atheist. In fact, if you, if you like, it seems to me that by, by adding on this strange being to all of that and saying, but what really gives us meaning and purpose is the fact that we were created by him and our purpose is to love and obey him, in a way that kind of trivialises our lives. It doesn't fill them with meaning and purpose. It, it, it takes away what's really important, it seems to me. So that, I think, is the positive case for being an atheist.